Amen. So as most of you know, we like to uh, begin service with some scripture and some prayer. <laughs> you know what's so great? What's so great about uh, the word is that we have it right in our pocket every day, right? And so I don't know how many of you are using the app on your phone where you can go and get the Bible in any translation right in your phone, right at your fingertips. What's cool about it is, um, you know, back in, back in the day, I like to say, when you're uh, talking with people and they're trying to share the Word of God with you, you just got to take their word for it before, right? But now when they recite scripture, you can go directly to the word right from your cell phone and look up exactly what scripture they're talking about. So this morning, our scripture comes from the book of John chapter 14 and verse 27, where the word says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give it to you as the world does. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Amen. So we want to open our hearts up to that this morning. We want to receive the peace of the Lord that only Jesus can give us this morning. So if we can, let's bow our heads and lift our hearts. Heavenly Father, we come before you as one body, one family, Father. So grateful for another day of life. And we come before you and we prepare our hearts to worship you this morning. We prepare our hearts to receive from the Holy Spirit this morning. We prepare our hearts to receive your word this morning. We thank you so much for all the people that are gathered here seeking you, seeking your guidance, your leadership, and putting you first, putting everything else aside and focusing our hearts and our minds on you this morning. Father, we thank you for, so much for this opportunity to worship you, that we get to worship you and make a joyful noise to you this morning. We thank you for the worship team, that is gonna lead us in worship. And we just wanna praise you and glorify you this morning, Father. We thank you so much for all that you do for us and through us. We love you, O oh Lord. We give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory, and we pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. amen. Thank you, Pastor Jason. Now I'm waiting for Pastor Jason to say, not only is it in my cellular phone which i have one i stand guilty as charged with everybody else but it's also the word of the lord also in your heart i was reminded of that because we were sitting yesterday um, out there um, at the men's get together and we were in hebrews i think ralph had just said 8 30 is a it's early in the morning, but I still like to be here. <laughs> Us too. We still like to be here at 8.30 in the morning. But that verse in Hebrew was uh, a verse that was very appropriate for now. Because that verse says, let us not forsake our own assembling. Like this. Let us not forsake our own assembling together as is the habit of some, because there were some people already not cho choosing not to meet. But let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. So we get to do that this morning. And the verse says, all the more as you see the day of the Lord drawing near. And so, you know, there are many conversations that take place about when the Lord will be returning. But uh, one thing I can say definitively is he's closer to coming back today than he was yesterday. And so um, sometimes thinking in spiritual terms is counterintuitive to the way we think in the world. Um, this first song that we'll sing to bring us into worship is one of those songs. It says, in essence, it says, if you want to, if you want to succeed, the best thing you can do is surrender to the Lord. The best thing you can do is surrender all. I stand guilty sometimes of saying, I surrender some. I, <laughs> not all. I don't want to surrender all. But the verse says, for us, for us to succeed, we surrender all. All to Jesus I surrender Trust. 
Trading my sorrow, I'm trading my shame. I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord. I'm trading my sickness, I'm trading my pain. I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord. Saying, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, amen. Do that for us again, yes, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, amen. I'm pressed but not crushed, persecuted, not abandoned, struck down but not destroyed. I'm pressed beyond the curse, but his promises endure. His joy is gonna be my strength. Oh, the sorrows may last for a night. His joy comes in the morning. I'm trading my sorrow. I'm trading my shame. I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord. I'm trading my sickness. I'm trading my pain. Yeah. I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord. I'm saying, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, amen. Amen, yes. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. La, 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 la,
gracious Lord, we love you. In Deuteronomy 31, 8, it says, the Lord himself goes before you. Just as he did it, as he brought his people uh, out of Egypt, he had the fire to bring them safely across in the, in the dark. The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Do not be afraid and do not be discouraged. Don't be afraid. And I know for all of us there are times when we are. But God is with us always. Amen. I just ask that you bless every, every soul that is here today. Lord, may the words that Cam brings uh, touch your hearts and I just pray if healing is is needed this morning that you put your healing touch on that person or persons thank you Lord thank you Lord for your wonderful mercy and grace to us praise your name Lord we love you and give you all the praise in Jesus name amen. thank you Lord thank you. amen and amen Psalm 42 says, As the deer panteth for the water, so my soul longeth after thee. I, you are long our martyrs, desire and I long to Sing that again. As the deer panteth for the water, so my soul longeth after thee. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship thee. My 
shield to you alone may my spirit yield you alone are my heart's desire and I long to worship thee you're my friend and you are my brother even though you are a king I love you more than any other so much more than anything you alone are my strength my shield that last part and I long to worship thee and I long and I long to worship thee I have secret to success. Jesus Christ 
His Son, and now let the weak say I am strong, let the poor say I am rich, because of what the Lord has done. to give thanks and then after you finish giving thanks then it's time for this if you have any doubt about your clapping follow Pastor Jason because he has perfect timing sing, shout, clap your hands joyful noise unto the Lord. Sing, shout, clap your hands, give praise unto your maker, for the Lord, he is almighty God. This is a day of celebration. This is a day gentlemen please take the next few minutes to greet one another with the love of the lord don't forget to say hi to the folks that are seated there on the lanai and don't forget to say hi to the virtual audience people tuned in on zoom when uh, chris comes around with the ipad good all right all right good morning new hope volcano Oh, <laughs> hey, 
all right, all right. I got to admit, I got to admit, that's the first time I ever say good morning and not one person said it back to me. <laughs> that that that's, takes the cake. We'll try that again. Good morning, New Hope Volcano. Good morning. Hallelujah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Praise the Lord. We have some announcements for you this morning. Um, a couple one. I'm going to call my wife up, but I have one that... This past Wednesday night, we finished the book of Isaiah, all 66 chapters. Yes. We have been immensely blessed, and we are moving on to the book of John. But before we get there, this Wednesday night at 5 o'clock, uh, we'll be watching a movie. We'll have movie night this Wednesday night. So even though you're not into the Bible study, you're not in the Bible study group, if you want to come and just fellowship and watch a movie, have some popcorn and some peanut M&Ms, hopefully. <laughs> then come join us at five o'clock. Now I do wanna preface by saying this, if you're here and you're in the Wednesday night group, I see you guys, five o'clock, okay? <laughs> I know New Hope Volcano, we run a little bit late, but five o'clock this Wednesday. <laughs> We want to start the movie because it's an hour and 27 minutes. The movie we'll, we, we'll be watching this Sunday is called The Risen. And I'll just share with you the storyline real quick. Uh, it follows the epic biblical story of the resurrection as told through the eyes of a non-believer. Clavius, a powerful Roman military tribune, and his aide Lucius are tasked with solving the mystery of what happened to Yeshua in the weeks following the crucifixion in order to disprove the rumors of a risen Messiah and present an uprising in Jerusalem. So that's the movie we'll be watching. And I saw the opening clip on YouTube and it looks awesome. It looks awesome. So if you want to join us, that's five o'clock this Wednesday. Um, and I think that's all the announcements I have. So I'll call my lovely wife up if she's ready. <laughs> Come on out. Good morning, New Hope Volcano. Good um, okay, ladies, I don't want to take up too much stage time, but I do have a couple announcements to make. One, our next women's study will be on the book of Daniel, June 24th. No. May. Oh. May 27th. And I looked at the calendar. Hello. May 27th, 8 a.m. over Zoom. Um, if you are not signed up with us and you want to join us, please let me know. All I need is your email and I can give you all of the information. I did come up here and I did talk about the Daniel fast, okay? But a sister had pointed out to me something very specific about the Daniel fast. So I had to restudy the book of Daniel. And in Daniel 1, it talks about him giving up, not even giving up, actually. He said he did, he did not want to defile his body to the kings, right? Um, and so for 10 days, he tells the kings, test us for 10 days. We're going to only eat vegetables and water, and you'll see that we are still strong. And so they did, and that's what it was. In Daniel 9 is when he fasts, but it is not specific about what he fasts, and how long he does it, but he is fasting and praying for the people because of the visions that he's receiving. In Daniel 10, he gives up, again, he's, he does without um, meat, rich foods, and wine, um, but that is because he is mourning, okay? So I am leaving it open to you women. Let the Holy Spirit lead you. You decide what you wanna pray about. You decide what you wanna fast and you decide how long you want to do it. Um, there's a standard fast, which is the Jesus fast, which is no food, only water. There is a complete fast, which I believe Moses did it in Exodus, where he fasted everything, including water. And then there's the partial fast, I guess you can call it, where you give up whatever you decide to give up. Um, either way, let the Holy Spirit lead you. Um, and we will be doing that in the month of June. So... My husband decided he's going to do it with me, yeah? 
<laughs> well, like I said, you decide how long you want to do it because there was a point where he only vegetables and water for 10 days. There was a point where he gave up most of his food, but he also stopped taking a bath. I'm pretty sure that's what it meant when he said he didn't lotion himself or put oils and stuff. So he was mourning. He was very down. Um, so, yeah, I just want you to think about that. Also, we have hospitality, which I help the children do. I say I help because they're the ones that decided that they wanted to pick it up after COVID and everything shut down. Um, unfortunately, most of our youth are graduating this year and they're going off to college. So we will be losing some of our most important hands in hospitality. And as much as I want to do everything in the church, I cannot. <laughs> we are the body. We all together as one big ohana keep everything going. Um, I only can do what I can do because of the support I receive from you, because of the prayers I receive from you. So I encourage you guys, maybe you can do it while you're fasting. Ask God to reveal to you, how can I serve in the church? What am I doing for the body of Christ? How am I contributing? Am I serving? And if not, Lord, what can I do? Okay, so I love you all. See you later. Thank you, yeah, you know, that's one of the, the greatest blessings of having a godly wife is that whenever a topic for discussion comes up, we both just dive right into the Bible and we go back and forth and we start studying and we start looking. So the, uh, the Daniel fast, everybody, <laughs> the Daniel fast, you know, when we first looked at it, there was all these restrictions, tons and tons of restrictions. And so we were like, wait, does, does it say that in the Bible? Does it even say that in the Bible? So we went into the Bible and we started looking all over Daniel for it. And we finally found it in Daniel 9, but it wasn't quite exactly how they explain it, right? In, in everywhere else. Um, so we got to the bottom of it and it's not this structured thing. It's whatever that you want to however you want to do it. It's between you and the Lord. I can say that I agreed to do it with Stacy, and I'm hungry already. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. You guys, I'm going to pray, but you guys pray for me too. Um, okay, our next announcement comes from our sister Chris. Good morning. And to Ivalani told me I had to wear this lei. Isn't it beautiful? Yeah. It's in honor of the graduates. <laughs> I wasn't emotional yesterday when she graduated. Um, anyway, on June 4th, we are going to be honoring all the graduates of the church, uh, Coral and Sela and Kaonoi and Mara, um, that's Hoku's daughter, and Ike, some of you might remember, he used to come a lot when he was younger. We're going to try and get him back. Um, I think there's also a young grandchild who's graduating on Oahu from college. If you have any graduates that you'd like to, um, you know, we can just share, even if they're your grandchildren or et cetera on the mainland, you know, we're going to be praying for them and honoring them on June 4th. Uh, Monday, people will be getting together to pray, so please put your prayer requests in the bowl or pass them to one of us. Wednesday, Bible study, I heard 5 o'clock. Um, Thursday, hula at 5 o'clock, come and join. Friday night, celebrate recovery. Yeah. Uh, dinner is at 5.30 and large group starts at 6.00 at least the women's group, we've been thinking a lot, reading a lot about codependency. You know, when you put your children, your husband, your other people ahead of you, something to think about. Um, so that means Celebrate Recovery is not only drugs, alcohol, it's also any hurt, habit, or hang up that you'd like to be freed from. Um, men's ministry met yesterday, and they're gonna meet again on June 17th probably. Women's ministry is uh, May 27th on Zoom only. The thrift shop is open in the month of June. I think I was announcing that it was going to be closed, so they let me know. Nope, 
It's going to be open the first and third Saturdays from 9 to 12. And we do have a virtual home on newhopevolcano.com. And also on Facebook, you just put in New Hope Volcano. And also we're streaming live on YouTube and Zoom right now. If you want to uh, have any of that information, just send me your, give me your email address so I can add you to the weekly email. And the most important thing about fasting is praying. Aloha. Thank you, sister. So we are about to collect the tithes and the offerings. Like Chris said, we have a website, newhopevolcano.com. You can give your tithe or your offering on the website if you like. Um, just type it in, newhopevolcano.com. On the top of the homepage, there's a place where you can give online. You can do it that way if you like. If you're in the building and you want to give your tithe or your offering, we have the offering bowl in the back where Uncle Eddie is. Feel free to drop it off uh, whenever you have a chance. Uh, and we say all of that just to say, of course, if you're visiting us for the first time, please hold back on your money and just be blessed with what the Lord has in store for you this morning. If you're visiting us from another church, we ask that you too, please hold back on your money. And if this is your home church, we just ask that you give with a cheerful heart. If we could bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning with grateful hearts. Grateful that we can wake up and, and have another day of life. Grateful that we can come and gather with our brothers and sisters and, and fellowship. It's such a blessing to come to church and see all the smiling faces. It's such a blessing that we can come to church and pray for one another, love on one another, give each other hugs, worship next to each other. We thank you for providing this building that we can come together because we know that we individually make up the church. Father, we thank you for the word that we're about to hear this morning. We pray that it dwell richly on our hearts. We thank you for providing for us in every way that all of our needs, we know that we can turn to you. We can trust you to provide all that we need, not only financially, but spiritually, relationally, everything that we could need, we know we can trust in you to provide. So Father, this morning we lift our tithes and our offerings up to you. We pray that you multiply it in abundance. We pray that you use it according to your will. Father, we just want to continue to, to bask in your Holy Spirit this morning. We want to continue to be in your presence and, and to absorb your word that's coming from our brother Kea this morning. We love you so much. We give you all of the honor, the glory, and the praise, Father. And we pray in Christ Jesus' mighty name. Amen, amen. and amen. How about helping me welcome our brother Kea this morning? Love you. Love you. Hello, church. Can you guys hear me? Oh, yeah, there it is. No echo, 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 echo. Just joking. How's everybody this morning? Praise Jesus. What a beautiful day. You know, this morning, we're going to focus mainly um, on Romans chapter 11, beginning in verse 1, and we're going to go through the whole chapter. Um, the title of our message this morning is Grafted. Can you please join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, thank you so much. We know that your heart is after us as it's revealed in the word. And we just want, we just so desire to be transformed because your heart has blessed our lives. And so we look to you this morning in Jesus' name and everyone said, amen. amen. So the book of Romans is one of the most powerful books in the entire Bible. It is, it has the power to change people's lives. Just ask Pastor Jason. That's his favorite book in the Bible. And that book actually helped change his life and bring him to Jesus. Paul is concerned, though, in chapter 11, because his brethren, the Israelites, don't have the victory that we have in Christ. Not just victory, but surpassing victory. Amen? But they don't have this. And so he's concerned for them, and he says, his heart's desire is prayer to God for them, for their salvation. Because, yeah, they got zeal. They got lots of zeal. But it's not according to knowledge. And that's a tragedy. Because they missed it. They missed it. 
um, <clears throat> they stumbled over the stumbling stone. They took offense at God's son. But he was the answer that God gave to the world. Every sinner would have a relationship, an opportunity to have a relationship to the holy and righteous God. So the tragedy is that they got zeal, but their zeal is so misplaced because he says the entire Old Testament points to Jesus, and they missed it, completely missed it. See, the problem that he's talking about is what we call hardness of the heart. Because God determined before the foundation of the world that he would send his son as the answer. And they instead insisted resting on their own works and their own accomplishment. And they rejected God's answer. They rejected the Messiah. So here's the question. What is God's response to that? Does he reject them in response? They wouldn't heed the glad tidings of good things. They wouldn't open their hearts. They didn't have faith. So what does God do in response? Does he reject them? Is God done with Israel forever? Now this is really a, a very important question because the times which we are living now, and I'm sure each, each of you, some of you follow the news and you watch and you see things that are happening around the world today. And I'm going to be transparent with you. I am very concerned. I'm happy because I know Jesus is coming soon. Amen. But I'm very concerned. And I'm concerned for those that don't know him. We see these things and we need to understand them. And the best way to understand the events of the times in which we are living is against the backdrop of the prophecy of Scripture. Basic instructions before leaving earth. The Bible. It's very important because Israel more and more and more is in the news. And will be more and more in the news as we move forward into the last days. So the question is, is God done with Israel? Are they relevant any longer? Or have they been cast aside? One of the most important places to begin, I think, is actually in the last verse of the last verse of Romans chapter 10, verse 21, where he says, Now as for all Israel, all day long I've stretched out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. See, I love that verse because he wouldn't stretch out his hands to them if he rejected them. Amen? This is God's grace. And I love this because he reveals God's heart. The extent of God's grace is that though they have rejected him, he holds his hands out all day long. And that's what we're going to see, even to the end of age, because this story is going to have a glorious conclusion. When you read this chapter, you will find it. It's a very, very important chapter. And it's important because, unfortunately, there is a certain branch of theology today that declares God is done with his people. That he has cast away Israel. That the nation that bears the name Israel in the Middle East is of no greater significance than Canada or Argentina. It just happens to bear the name Israel. It's important when you look at the events that are happening. And any student of scripture should be concerned about this. About what's happening. And we need to understand whether Israel has biblical significance in prophecy. Scripture tells us very important things about those last days. How does this come together? Some might, like Jude, spiritualize Israel, right? And they'll say, well, we actually are Israel. The church is Israel, like replacement theology or something. We are Israel. All the promises given to Israel are actually transferred to us, the church. We're the new Israel. The problem with that is this. As I look at it, 
There are some prophecies about Israel in the latter days that says they're going to go through some really difficult and turbulent times. I'm concerned if they think that we're the new Israel because that means, ladies and gentlemen, we in for some major lickings. We're going to get it. But thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. That's not what Scripture tells us. Others say, no, let's not spiritualize Israel. We actually know where Israel is. The lost 10 tribes of Israel have been found. You probably heard of the lost 10 tribes of Israel. I personally don't believe in the lost 10 tribes. I believe all 12 tribes are accounted for. They're known by God, amen? But some suggest what actually happened to those last 10 tribes is they went into, the nor into Northern Europe. So like look at Denmark, right? They're called, the people that live in Denmark are called Danish, right? The word ish in Hebrew means man. So they say that the Danish people are the people of Dan. And the Finnish people are the people of Issachar. And then continue on, the British and the Finnish and all the Finnish. And the, but when you look at it, it's actually foolish. That was a joke. <laughs> Hallelujah. <clears throat> Paul's making a really, really good point, though, with a big exclamation mark. God has not rejected his people. Now, this is important. He says, may it never be. When you understand God's heart for Israel, it strengthens your faith because you realize that the word of God never, ever fails. The promises of God are sure. And then you take a hold of those great promises for our lives and realize it actually strengthens our faith. Amen? To see God's unwavering commitment to his covenant to Israel. So, this is important because Jesus made an interesting statement in Luke 18. He said, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on the earth? Hmm, let that resonate a little bit. We're living in troublesome, difficult times. You look at what's happening. The ground seems to be shaking as the earth is changing right before our eyes. How do we understand this? When troubles come, many people's faith is shaken to the core. But you look at what God gives in his word as the promise to Israel and the promise to us, and our faith is strengthened. We need strong faith, and it's my prayer that this chapter will strengthen our faith as we go through it this morning. So moving forward, Romans chapter 11, beginning in verse 1. I say then, God has not rejected his people, has he? May it never be. God forbid it. I too am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. And we're going to look at that in a minute. Do you know what the scripture says in the passage about Elijah? How he pleads with God against Israel? Lord, they've killed your prophets. They've torn down your altars. And I alone am left. And they're seeking my life. And what's the div divine response to Elijah? I have kept myself 7,000 men who have not bowed a knee to Baal. In the same way, when, in the same way then, that there has also come to be, at the present time, a remnant according to God's gracious choice. If it is by grace, it's no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. What then that, what then that which Israel is seeking for, it has not obtained. But those who were chosen, they obtained it. And the rest were hardened. Now he's speaking about the danger of a hard heart. But then he brings an aspect of it for many people. They get kind of surprised about it. <clears throat> but it's seen in Scripture in so many different places. God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes to see not, 
and ears to hear not down to this very day. So what does that mean? David continues with it. Let their table become a snare and a trap on a stumbling block and a retribution to them. Let their eyes be darkened to see not and bend their backs forever. I say then, did they not stumble so as to fall? Did they? May it never be. But by their transgression, their rejection of the Messiah, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make them jealous. Now we're going to look at more verses. The book of Romans is just filled with so many tremendous important insights. And this chapter is so important because one of the things we need to understand is what's happening with Israel in the future prophetic word. One of the things we need to see right out of scripture is this, that God committed in advance. God's promises are sure, and he's committed to them. He says in in advance, he made a promise to Isaac, Abraham, and Jacob, and determined in advance that he would bless their children forever. Now, he knew that they, their children, guess what? They're going to reject the Messiah. He knew that. He knew it in advance. But he also knows the end, just like we do. He also knows that this is going to gloriously turn into the grand finale. He knew the end, and he was committed to them in advance. And so I look at that, and I think, you know what? God knew in advance that they would reject the Messiah, but he also knew how this is going to end because it's glorious. And that's what we're going to see when we come through this. He knew they would reject the Messiah. He knows the end before the beginning, but his word stands forever, and his gifts and calling are irrevocable. I'm going to say that again. His gifts and calling are irrevocable. You know, in Jeremiah 31, 31, there's this prophecy, and it says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. In other words, the new covenant through Jesus Christ is going to be given to Israel first. It's the fulfillment of God's promise to Israel. And although they are going to reject it, God's word will not fail. It's going to have a glorious end. Now, one of the things he points out, Paul, is that God always has a remnant. God always has a remnant. This is key. <clears throat> the old covenant, covenant is coming to an end. Jesus is the grand finale of the old covenant, and his blood is the beginning of the new covenant. And, through most of is, and though most of Israel would reject it, there would be some. There would be some. There would be a few who receive it. God always has a remnant. Jesus said the same in Matthew 7, verse 14, where he says, the gate is small, the way is narrow, that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Paul uses himself as an example, and he says that he's an Israelite, right? He's from the tribe of Benjamin. He's an example that there are a few. Amen? Then he brings up Elijah as the example. You might remember the story of Elijah back in the days when Israel was divided north and south <clears throat> and the northern ten tribes were going through their darkest hour and completely had their backs turned on God and they had gone to worldly things. And so God sent the powerful prophet Elijah to challenge them, to call them back, to bring them to revival. At one point, he said, assemble the nation at Mount Carmel. So he brings a great multiple together, multitude together and he stands before them and he challenges them. And he says, how long will you waver between two opinions? And I love this. If God be God, then serve him. And if Baal is God, then serve him. But he just calls it straight up. 
And then he says, let's have Baal and Jehovah, an altar be set up to each one. See whose God answers with fire. And so the prophets of Baal started chanting, oh, no, 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 and calling out, ranting and raving. Do you know they actually started cutting themselves? And guess what? Baal didn't show up. Come on now. He didn't show up. And then, you know, Elijah said a simple prayer, real simple prayer. But first he said, douse this with water. Three times he flooded it. Flooded it out with water. A simple prayer that they might know that you are Jehovah. And fire came and it consumed. A glorious grand moment of fire from heaven came. Seize the prophets of Baal. And you know, it was a great victory that day. And then Jezebel sent word to Elijah. The same will be done to you by this time tomorrow. So what does Elijah do? Run. He ran. He ran all the way down to Beersheba. And he continued, into, and he went down there, and he hid in this cave. And God came to him, and he says, How come you stay over here, Elijah? Why are you here? And this is where he calls out against Israel. He said, they've torn down your altars. They've killed your prophets. And now they're seeking to kill me. The Lord said, stand before the Lord on the mountain. So he goes out and he's on this mountain. And the scripture tells us that a great wind, a great storm came and rending that mountain and breaking it into pieces. But the Lord is not in the wind. Then a great earthquake shook that mountain. But the Lord was not the earthquake. Fire came. God wasn't in the fire. And a still, small voice. What are you doing here? Why are you here? Go! I've kept 7,000 that have not bended a knee to Baal. 7,000 have heard my voice. This is really important to understand in today's context. It's so relevant. Elijah is frustrated. He saw the condition of the world, the condition of things, and he wanted some great demonstration of power. Bring a storm over this land, Lord. Shake these people with a mighty earthquake. Bring fire from heaven on all these people. And there's a part of, uh, of this that I'm sure each and every one of us can relate to. <clears throat> you know, there's a part of us <clears throat> that sees what's happening in the world today. And, you know, because the news is broadcast daily, you know, uh, we see more and more of what's happening in the world than ever before. And frankly, we don't have the stomach, really, to watch what's happening. You know, when I saw those 21 Christians being beheaded on the beach in Libya years ago, or just like a few days ago, when I see constant rocket attacks going to Israel, to God's people, there's something inside of me that says, God, do something about this. This is a tragedy. Do something. Shake these people. Bring, bring fire from heaven. Please do something, God. We want to write the script <laughs> that God will follow. Amen. We want God to do something. Demonstrate your power, Lord. Then I thought to myself, is that really going to cause somebody to believe? Was there a revival after the fire from heaven came on Mount Carmel? Oh, there was not. There's an interesting story in the book of Luke, chapter 16. A wealthy man died, but there was a poor beggar who used to sit at the gate named Lazarus, who also died. And Lazarus was comforted in Abram's bosom. Abraham's bosom, excuse me. But the rich man was across in this chasm in Hades. And he saw all of this. And he said, Lord, send Lazarus up to my relatives. I don't want them to come to this place. Send him up to my relatives that they might hear 
And Abraham said this in Luke 16, verse 31. If they won't listen to Moses and the prophets, in other words, they've got the word of God. God has been speaking to them through the word of God. And he said, they're not going to listen to, if they're not going to listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded. Even if someone rises from the dead, like Jesus. That's a powerful word. God told Elijah, I have 7,000 that have not bowed a knee to Baal because God spoke to them in that still, small voice. You see, God speaks to hearts. Did you know that there's a revival going on today in Iran? Did you know that? And how is it happening? God is speaking to them in their dreams. He's coming to them in their dreams in that still, small voice. Romans 10.8, what does it say? The word is near you. It's in your mouth. It's in your heart. This word of faith which we are preaching. Because God is going to use his grace. See, this is the thing. God has chosen grace. He's going to speak in that still, small voice to hearts. And it's by grace. That fire from heaven, grace speaking to them. The word of grace. And it's by grace. And if it's by grace, Paul goes on to say, then it's no longer by works. Graciously called out. No longer. It is by works because they're mutually exclusive. It's either by works or grace. But here's the point that he's trying to make. Works doesn't work, okay? Works don't work. It's by grace. And what is grace? It's very important to understand the definition of grace. And I kind of laid it out for you. It's in your notes. <clears throat> A simple biblical definition would be grace is the kindness of God, the favor of God to those who do not deserve it. And by the way, there's the other side of the coin. There's another side of the coin which is called mercy. Mercy is the withholding of God of that which a person deserves. I'm thankful for God's grace, and I'm thankful for his mercy. And he says it's by grace and grace alone. Otherwise, grace is not grace, undeserved. I was thinking of a way to kind of illustrate it, and it might be kind of like a young person who wants to be accepted, adopted into a family. You know, he sees this man, and he really wants to be adopted into this guy's family. So he starts just coming over and mowing his lawn, and the guy comes out, and he's like, what are you doing? He says, I'm cutting your grass. And he says, why? He says, I want to show you how well I can mow lawns so that you'll accept me. And then he comes out another day, and he's washing the car, you know, and the guy's like, what are you doing? And he's like, well, I want to show you how well I can wash cars so that you can accept me. This is not the way it works. Works don't work. It's grace. He says even he says in verse 7 that which Israel is seeking it has not obtained because they wouldn't take it by faith but as though it were by works. Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9. It makes it so clear, right? For by grace you've been saved through faith that not of yourselves the gift, the gift of God, not as a result of your work, so that no one would boast. But then he goes on, and he talks about the others. There are some who listen to that still small voice. What about the others? And this is what he says. Hard hearts get hardened. Try saying that three times fast. Hard hearts get hardened. Amen. You're still with me. Praise Jesus. 
He'll draw all men to himself. Jesus on the cross, carrying the sin of the world. God's offer of amazing grace. The forgiveness offering to all. He says he draws all men. And how does he draw all men? He knocks on the door of their hearts. The word has gone out that the cha- um, gone out that the chapter before this had they not heard. Oh, they've heard. They heard it very well. They heard it loud and clear, right? They've heard the word as it's gone out into the entire world. And that's all they've heard. How does he draw them in? He knocks on the door of their heart. He knocks on the door of their heart. What makes their heart hard? They don't open the door. Real simple. But he graciously keeps on knocking. Hey, guess what? I'm still here. I love you. And he knocks louder. Please come. Please come and listen to me. Please come and talk to me. He keeps on knocking. And then he begins to press. And he'll start to press each and every one of us. And he'll press all day long. Chapter 10, verse 21. All day long I've held up my hands to them. He knocks louder. So the Lord begins to press even more. And they grow more and more resistant. And their hearts get harder and thicker and more calloused. Hard hearts get hardened. God speaks to hearts with that still, small voice. Ministering by the Spirit. Some listen, some hear. Others stop up their ears and become dull of hearing, unfortunately. All right, so back to chapter 11. But now, I'm sorry, because now what he's going to tell us is that is this thing is going to end gloriously. You see, Israel is going to be grafted in again. This thing's going to have a glorious end. And we need to understand that. So let's go back to verse 12. Pick up in verse 12. Now if their transgression be riches for the world and their failure be riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their fulfillment be? In other words, he's saying, you might say, their loss, our gain, right? Their failure is riches for the Gentiles. But here's the question. When they come back again, is their gain our loss? Mm -mm. It's like glory multiplied. It's going to be amazing. He's given us a hint that this thing's going to be glorious. Keep moving, he says in verse 13. I'm speaking to you who are Gentiles. Inasmuch as I'm a Gentile and a gentle apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. If somehow I might move to jealousy my fellow countrymen and save some of them, God's going to provoke them. God's going to stir them up. God's using the goads of God to stir them up and nudge them in the ribs and brah, wake up, right? He's trying to stir up the people. But if, their re- but if their rejection be the reconciliation of the word, what will their acceptance be? This thing's going to end gloriously. If the first piece of dough was holy, then the whole lump is holy. Amen? If the root is holy, then the branches are too. And then he uses the analysis and illustration and analogy of the tree, right? And the branches cut off of that tree is Israel. And he uses this picture in verse 17. Some of the branches were broken off, right? And then you, being from that wild olive tree, me, okay? Here's the picture. And we're in the picture. He says now, we are, the, we are from the wild olive tree. You were the wild olive branches and you were cut off of that wild olive tree and you, when you accepted Jesus, you were grafted into the natural cultivated tree. And the point, of course, is that personal application. You be grafted into Christ. The rich root is the supply 
of all of it. I mean, if you have the spiritual fruit, he says it comes from Christ. Be grafted into Christ. God's holy tree, right? That's Christ. If you have any spiritual fruit in your life, guess what? It's because you're abiding in him. Come on, somebody. Any spiritual life, anything, anything good and godly that's happening in your life, it's because you're abiding in Christ. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> and no other reason. The fruit comes from the riches of the root that the sap supplied, right? But he goes on to say they were cut off. And then in verse 18 is really key. He says, don't be arrogant, therefore, toward the branches. If you're arrogant, remember this. It's not you who supports a root, but the root supports you. In other words, he's talking about your attitude towards Israel. What should your attitude towards Israel be? Now, it's really important, and I tell you why it's important. Because there's a verse in the book of Genesis, one of the most significant verses in this regard. And it's in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, where it says, God is making a promise to Abraham and his descendants forever. And he says, those who bless you, I will bless those who curse you will be cursed. I'm convinced that that verse is still very applicable to this present day. And in fact, <clears throat> I'm convinced that every nation on earth should take heed of that verse. And the United States of America needs to take heed of that verse also. We got to support Israel because of the this, this, uh, scriptural position that God puts Israel into. They are God's chosen people, and those of us, Israel will be blessed. I'm convinced <clears throat> that we as a nation must be committed to Israel. Unfortunately, I have to report to you that the country's support for Israel is waning. And this is why he says in verse 18, be very careful about your attitude towards Israel. This is exceptionally important because of, unfortunately, throughout the history of the church, there's been a really unfortunate relationship between the church and the Jews. For many, many years, in fact, there have been many elements of the church that have blamed the Jews for the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And some wanted to avenge that. But you know, as I thought about this, and I read my word, my Bible tells me that Jesus died for the sins of the world. We're all responsible for Jesus dying on the cross. It was God's plan before the foundation of the world that he would send his son to bear our sin on the cross. It was God's plan from the beginning. Are we supposed to be angry with Israel because they crucified our Lord? It was God's plan from the beginning. We crucified our Lord. It's our sins that did it, not just the Jewish people. I think you'd be surprised today at how many people are against Israel. I know because I've talked to quite a few of them lately, and I see it on social media. There's a growing trend against Israel and throughout the country. So let's go back to Romans, verse 19. You might say, well, hey, branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, that is right. They were broken off for their unbelief. But you stand by your faith. Do not be conceited, but fear, humility. Have an attitude of humility. And he goes on, if God didn't spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Behold then, the kindness and severity of God. Verse 22 is really interesting. Behold then the kindness and severity of God. You know, when I read that, it reminded me of a scene from Chronicles of Narnia. I talked about um, that in another uh, sermon. I really, really, really like that book and that movie. One of the scenes that unfolds 
<clears throat> these four kids are coming into Narnia, right? And at one point, they hear about Aslan, who's a lion. So the kids hear about Aslan, and they say, he's a lion. I'm not sure I would like to meet a lion. Is he safe? And I love the answer. Of course he's not safe. He's a lion. But surely he's good. I love that. Behold the kindness and severity of God. Is he safe? Of course he's not safe. He's a lion. But surely he's good. Behold the kindness and severity of God to those who fell severity. But to you, kindness, if you continue in his kindness, otherwise you will be cut off. And they also, if they don't continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in. God is able to graft them in again. If you're cut off from that which is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted contrary to nature into a cultivative olive tree, how much more shall these who are natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? Amen? I don't want you to be unaware, brethren, or uninformed of this mystery, lest you be wise in your own estimation. Here's the key that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come. And thus, therefore, here's the key phrase, all of Israel will be saved. Just as it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. But this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. So he says, the hardening of Israel They've been cut off from the trees only temporarily until the fulfillment or fullness of the Gentiles come in. There's a great parable that Jesus uses. This is Matthew 22, verses 8 and 9, where he talks about the king who's going to have a great wedding feast, and he invites the nobles of the world, right? And he invites the people of significance. And guess what? Everybody's got an excuse. They reject the invitation. Oh, my auntie coming from Honolulu, I cannot go, you know. It's a picture of Jesus. Think about it. Offering the invitation to Israel first. But they rejected it. Matthew 22, verses 8 and 9, he says, Then he said to his servants, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Go, therefore, to the main highways, and as many as you find there, invite to the wedding feast. This is a great picture of the gospel being given to the Gentiles. Go out into the highways. Look for the destitute, the broken. Bring them in. Give them each a wedding garment so that they might come into the wedding fully dressed. Amen. The robe of righteousness what a beautiful picture. And God knows exactly how many Gentiles will be coming to this wedding feast. And when the last Gentile has come into the wedding feast, God will move to restore Israel. How many, you ask? I don't know. Only God knows. But God's counting. I know that. And he knows the fullness of the Gentiles. And when the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, and the last one is listened to that still small voice, Israel will be restored. Because here's the key. The gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. Irrevocable. The gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. You know, one of the questions I think that sometimes discuss and debate in the church is whether or not someone can lose their salvation. I'm convinced that a person cannot lose their salvation because this is the one key, uh, th this one of the key verses right here, okay? The gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. 
I think it's a picture of adoption. No matter what attitude, no matter what challenges you have, no matter what you're bringing, no matter your waywardness, that gavel came down and declared that you were a son of daughter, and that is irrevocable. The judge put his gavel down. It's done, period. <clears throat> There's a statement that Paul makes, and I don't know how much clearer Paul can be in this. God is not finished with Israel. God, he says, has put up with all the disobedience that he might show mercy to all. But here's the key to this. This thing ends gloriously. When God restores Israel, it's going to be glorious. They're going to open their eyes from their blindness, and they will receive their Messiah. They will be restored, but only because they're going to recognize Jesus as their salvation and their Messiah. When they are brought into, they are brought in through the blood of Jesus. So here's an example, another verse, Zechariah 12.10. I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and the spirit of supplication so that they will look on me whom they have pierced and they will mourn for him as one mourns for only a son. Why are they going to mourn? Because their eyes are going to be opening. They're going to say, our Messiah was amongst us 2,000 years ago, and we completely missed it. And we crucified him. They'll look on him who they pierced, and they'll mourn him, but they'll be restored. Because why? He's going to pour out that spirit of grace and the spirit of supplication, and they'll be restored through the blood of Jesus. In other words, they're restored only when they receive their Messiah. Their eyes will be opened. They'll be grafted in again. That's so cool. Into the tree. You know, in, I in Isaiah, he uses an image of the same idea. The tree with the branches cut off. But he goes a little further. He actually says it's not just a branch here or there that's cut off. God takes and cuts off the whole tree, not just a couple branches. He cuts that tree down, the whole thing, right? You know, and then it starts to regrow. And a branch comes out, and a mighty tree grows out of that stump. That stump, that growth, that stem that springs forth is Jesus. They will be grafted in, but only into Jesus. Here's another verse. <clears throat> I didn't, it's not on, um, I didn't make a slide for it, but if you have it and on the notes or you can have it in your Bible, Isaiah 11. And um, let's see. I want to look at verse 33 of the previous chapter, so 1033. Behold, the Lord God of hosts will lop off the boughs with a terrible crash, right? And then we're going on to chapter 11. Verse 1, then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse. Who is Jesse? That's David's father. The son of David is the Messiah. Amen. A branch from its roots will bear fruit, and the spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will delight in the fear of the Lord. Hallelujah. He will not judge by what his eyes see, nor make a decision by what his ears hear. But with, the, but with righteousness, he will judge the poor and decide with fairness for the afflicted on the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and the breath of his lips, and he will slay the wicked. Also, Righteousness will be the belt of his loins, and faithfulness will be the belt around his waist. <clears throat> Verse 6, <clears throat> following how you know it's the latter days of the earth itself will be changed, and the wolf will dwell with the lamb. Imagine that. 
And the leopard will lie down with the kid and the calf. And the young lion and the uh, fatling will lie down together. And the little boy will lead them. What little boy would not love to have a lion as a pet? Amen? Right? And the cow and the bear will graze together, and your young will lie down together. And the lion will eat straw like an ox. And the nursing child will play by the hole of the cobra. And the weaned child will put his hand into the viper's dead. Hey, mom and dad, I'm going to go play with the cobras. Okay, be back before dinner. They will not hurt or hurt her, destroy in all my holy mountain. For earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Then it comes about in that day that the nations will resort. The nations will resort to the root of Jesse, who will stand as a signal for the peoples as they rest. His resting place will be glorious. This, this thing really ends gloriously. But back to Romans 11, and we're going to finish off here. Um, it finishes real powerfully. Verse 33, oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments, how unfathomable his ways. Who has known the mind of the Lord and become his counselor? Who has first given to him that it might be paid back to him? For him, through him, and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever and ever. See, I don't know about you, but that just fires me up inside. That just like ignites a fire inside of me. It's going to end gloriously, guys. You know what I mean? It just, oh, my goodness. I'm just like, I want to run around, okay? It fires me up. Just think, God has declared the end before the beginning. This thing ends gloriously. You see all the things. We see the troubles of this world. And then you understand that God is king over the whole earth. He is sovereign. His hand rests over all nations. And this thing will end so awesome, so glorious, when the Lord himself returns and restores Israel and the nations will come to him. His resting place is going to be glorious. I don't know about you, but whoosh, I'm on fire. Um, I'm trying to contain myself. When the Lord returns, he will find faith in me and you, but will he find faith on the earth? Think about that. It's always been about faith. You know, we have a rock. And this rock doesn't move. His name's Jesus. He told us that we can trust him with the nations. And if we can trust him with the nations, we can trust him with our lives. Amen? Amen? So um, before I close, I'm going to, um, if you don't have an, uh, a relationship with Jesus, you know, those that are maybe here or online, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus and what I've been talking to you, talking about this morning, it's kind of digging inside of you and you hear that still small voice saying, brah, come to me. That's Jesus knocking at your door. <clears throat> Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for the hope that you've given to us, the life that you've given to us and extended to us by bringing us into that glorious understanding of the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Church, this morning, I got a question for you. Will you trust him? Will he find faith in you? If he can be trusted with the events of the world, you can trust him with the events of your life. Will you trust him? Will you stand on his rock? Will you open your heart and trust? Would you say that today to him? With all, the, all your heads bowed, will you please all join me in saying this?
and say it from your heart. God, I'm trusting you with all the things that concern me. I lay it all on this rock, this foundation. I will trust you, Lord. I will honor you with my life. So I now say that you can hear me. I say now so you can hear me. My neighbor can hear me. And the devil can hear me. Jesus Christ is my Lord. And I will follow him alone. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for loving me first. Lord, you are the glorious king over all the earth. And God, we honor and thank you for all and everything in Jesus' mighty name. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, this marks the formal conclusion to our Sunday service. We're going to sing one more song, or at least a part of another song. If you want to sing, stay in the room. If you're ready for some refreshments, I think it's ready outside. You can make your way through the door there to my right. Uh, if you're heading out, I give you the same uh, exhortation I give every Sunday. When you get to Highway 11, please, please be careful since cars go up and down very quickly there. Be sure you check left and right. Um, <clears throat> I think, so let's just end by doing this, because this is the best thing that we can say when the Lord speaks to us. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Amen. I'm saying yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, amen. Let's go on. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, amen. Amen.